Okay, good morning everyone. Can we have a better day, a better start of a day than talking about bioplastics? I don't think so. Uh, my name is uh, Bo Valtig and I am one of the founders of uh, Nordic Bioplastics Organization. And we are actually celebrating 10 years this year. We were founded in 2012. So it's a, it's a great year for us actually. And we have done a lot of job during those 10 years. Um, we have today around 70 member companies and it's growing all the time. Uh, and um, today we are working a lot with uh, lobby against our politicians. So far the, the last half year, we have been uh, discussing with three political parties in, in, uh, in, the Swe in Sweden. And we, our, our aim is to cover them all before this year is over. And we can absolutely conclude that there is a great interest among the politicians also about uh, bioplastics. And surprisingly, maybe I should say, quite a lot of knowledge. I was surprised that I've been talking to, to a lot of people who, who actually knows more than I believe that they should do. We also participate a lot on, on fairs and uh, we do webinars like this and uh, spread the info to the, to the members and um, uh, yeah, we, we work as a network, of course, and we are very close connected to, to the European Bioplastics Organization, uh, the, the great, the big uh, network of bioplastic companies in Europe. Um, so we have a lot of, lot of work together with them. Um, you know, bioplastics is an interesting market. Uh, sometimes you get a feeling that um, the fossil-based plastics industry feels the, the sees on bioplastic as the threat, but of course it's not. It's a possibility for, for that industry to, to show that uh, there is alternatives to the fossil based raw materials and the bioplastics is only like one percent of the total amount of plastics on the market so it, it's not really a threat but the, the forecast is really positive on the year 2026 uh, the, there should be around 7.5 million tons bioplastics on the market Today we have 2.4, so we are talking about 2% in the future. So that's not much, but it's still a lot of plastic. And what, what I like to say, what we like to say is that we should have the right plastic on the right place, of course. So where bioplastic is a good, good possibility, we should of course use that because it's fossil free. Um, today, uh, we are going to dig a little bit deeper into what's happening on the universities and the research institutes. Uh, maybe it will be a little bit more technical today and usually, but we think it's important to, to point out that there's a lot of things going on. And it's not only on the universities, it's not only on, on uh, in the research institutes. There's a lot of startups all around the world. If you, if you um, uh, Google bioplastics, you can see that. It seems that you can more or less produce bioplastic out of everything, but the problem normally is to scale it up to an industrial level, of course. So that's why not so much happens. But uh, I'm not going to talk anymore. I, I'm just going to say that um, uh, you will be able to get the, the presentations a little bit later in a PDF format. Uh, and uh, we will also record this and it will be on our webpage in, in a couple of weeks if you like to listen to it again. And if you have questions, use the chat and uh, we will try to, to put some questions to the speakers after their presentations. Maybe we will not have time to, to cover it all, but in that case, you will, uh, we will send it to them and they can answer you personally in that case. So I think we will start, you, you, we will start with uh, Mr. Mikael Hedenqvist from, from uh, Kungliga Tekniska Högskolan. And he's going to tell us a little bit about proteins um, as bioplastics. So Mikael, please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. So I will share the screen. Is it fully visible now? Yes, it is. Good, thank you. Yeah, so my name is Mikael. First of all, I should say I'm, I'm happy I will get the chance to talk here. So I'm a professor in polymeric materials and I've been working with proteins for quite some time actually and um, trying to find different applications for it and also exploring how, how, how the material works in, in different applications. Um, so what are proteins and protein plastics? You can consider proteins as nature's polyamides. 
uh, and um, but they are more uh, that, but they are fully amorphous. So so if polyamide is is uh, water sensitive, these are even more water sensitive because of that. But there is a lot of possibilities with protein plastics. You have a large variety of sources. Uh, it's a renewable resource, it's biodegradable, biodegradable, and it comes from bi. You can use bi and co-products, which uh, leads to an efficient use of resources. It is readily available, depending a bit on, on what the actual material is. Uh, proteins have a lot of hydroxyl groups, so they form strong networks, and that's the basis for achieving a good gas barrier. So they are usually good gas barriers. Foamable, they have quite good fire properties, so fire resistant properties, which I will show. Um, and you can tune the properties uh, by using the plasticizer and different contents of plasticizer. I said byproducts and co-products. Here are some examples. So wheat gluten, for example, is, is a co-product from the production of starch for ethanol uh, or uh, syrup uh, or bio, uh, yeah, biofuel. Whey protein is a, is a byproduct from cheese production. Potato protein is a byproduct from the potato starch production. Raised proteins from biodiesel production. And then there are also, so these are all food related materials, uh, but there are also other um, sources which are not related to food. For example, oil crops such as uh, cranberry, which is toxic and, and not meant for, for uh, 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 eating. There are challenges. I mentioned the high moisture sensitivity, but so are also PA6, PLA and polyvinyl alcohol. They are quite brittle with a few exceptions. They're quite brittle. So you normally need a plasticizer. There are exceptions from that. For example, a fibrin is relatively uh, tough and, and uh, um, uh, keratin also. Cohesion could be a problem. Processability can also be an issue, but there are also other polymers which are difficult to process. Food source, a lot of these examples are, are actually food uh, items. So one has to be careful uh, when considering these materials from that point of view. Since it's natural material, you can have a source variation and content over the, over the year or from year to year. Smell can be an issue. For example, whey protein smell cheese and, and wheat gluten smell bread. Um, color can be an issue, and the long-term behavior of these materials are largely unexplored. Um, so, so, um, but, but there are, there are, so there are challenges and there are possibilities. Um, I will give most examples now from uh, wheat gluten, which is probably the most cohesive of, of the normal proteins available. That's because of its very large molecules. Um, the glutenines, which is part of gluten, is, is probably the largest uh, molecules in nature. And actually, when you bake, uh, you're actually polymerizing the material even further. You do a, a polymerization and a cross-linking uh, event when you're baking. And that's why the bread becomes, or the dough becomes stiffer and stiffer when you knead it, uh, and also when you heat treat it. What is important with these materials is that they normally contain uh, cross-links disulfide crosslinks. And those are usually intramolecular from the beginning, but they can form between molecules when you, for example, need a dough. And that gives you a, a stronger and stronger network, almost like a thermoset if you treat it with high, at high temperature, for example. Here are some examples on, on um, uh, what one can make from, uh, in this case, wheat gluten. If you don't use a plasticizer, you'll have a stiff material. Uh, stiff and brittle, if you put plasticizer in it, you have PVC-like or LDP-like properties. Uh, and if you have, that's when you have a relatively large amount of plasticizers, for, for medium amount of plasticizer, you can make semi-rigid uh, uh, trays, for example. Here are some wheels actually produced with uh, wheat gluten. The moisture uh, issues can be dealt with by coating. With a, with a paint, for example. This coin here to the lower left is completely moisture resistant. It, it uh, sustains water as well as very high uh, uh, relative humidity. Uh, uh, for these materials, for the proteins to be able to compete with fossil-based uh, uh, polymers, they have to be, one has to be able to 
process them with conventional plastic processing techniques. But that's usually not really a problem if one knows the parameters and so on for the processability. Uh, and I will give some examples say, here uh, throughout. So uh, casting, or if you code paperboard, for example, with the dispersion of, of this material, you need to make it uh, readily dispersible and that you have to do uh, by, by changing the pH of the material. Proteins have an isoelectric point and, and at that point, the material is very difficult to dissolve or disperse. So you have to treat it, go up or down in pH, but then you can get very nice films and also coatings. Um, hot pressing or, or compression molding is probably the best technique for this material. And here are some examples uh, of that. You see the film again. Here are two centimeter thick plates, compression molded. And here's actually uh, um, packagings were made. So, so you, ha you have to be able to weld the material. And if you add a plasticizer to it, you, are, you can weld it very well as, as, as illustrated here. Uh, if you want to improve the strength, when you put a plasticizer in the material, the, the strength uh, is reduced. That you can compensate for with putting fibers into the material. This is an example of a non-woven uh, flax fiber network, which has been combined with, with the gluten. Uh, and that gives you um, uh, very high strength, and also, but also flexibility, uh, as you see in the, in the middle figure here. Uh, we are also looking at other ways of, for example, improving the strength. And here's uh, that I think is quite interesting. You could produce an in situ composite by producing a biochar of the same material. So you, you pyrolyze uh, the gluten and then the particles you get, the biochar, you can implement into the polymer matrix and improve the, the mechanical properties if that's needed. So it's an all gluten based composite. Uh, extrusion is generally uh, more difficult than, than compression molding for these type of materials, but it all depends on, on uh, the, the additives you put in and the parameters to choose. If you look at the sample to the left, lo lower part, uh, there's very nice and, and, uh, and uh, high quality films that we've been producing from extrusion. If you don't do anything else, put something else into the material, it is rather difficult to extrude because it has a relatively high viscosity, although it's shear thinning like other polymers. This is a big difference from, from pure thermoplastic materials. So we, we can call proteins as uh, uh, quasi uh, thermo uh, moldable or thermoplastic materials. And that's because you have these crosslinks in the material and uh, uh, you can reprocess the materials, no problem. But you have to be careful when you go up in temperature. A normal thermoplastic, you would see a lower and lower stiffness of the melt. But for, uh, for the protein, you would see an increase in the modulus and an aggregation of the material if you go too high up in temperature. That's because you are redistributing the disulfide bonds in the material. Uh, and this is what you make use of, for example, when you permanent your hair with the keratin, it's you are redistributing the disulfide bonds uh, in the keratin. Uh, you can injection mold the materials. That's, uh, I would say, a bit easier than extrusion. Here are some two examples to the left here where we have a coated injection molded item and then an un uncoated one to the, to the right, the black one. Um, but it's readily uh, extrude, um, injection moldable. We can also foam the materials. And in this case, you see examples of vacuum or freeze drying, I should say, which is not really an interesting process uh, commercially, but it allows us to make uh, foams readily and in different uh, geometries. But we're also extruding foam. We also use foam extrusion. Um, so, one very interesting property with these proteins is that, as I mentioned before, they are quite fire. They are much more fire resistant than polystyrene or, or polyurethane, for example. They also produce a large amount of char when they burn. So it's good properties if you consider making foam uh, materials from this material. You can see the lower two pictures here show the foam material before a fire and after a fire. You es essentially have the porous structures uh, even after remaining after the fire. 
Uh, with these foams, we can we have also been developing uh, what we call super absorbent uh, uh, polymers. They are not to the they are not super absorbing to the extent of the commercially available uh, 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 super absorbents, but they 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 uh, they, they can swell uh, quite a lot and take up forty times four to fifty times its own weight in, in in with water, for example. So we're exploring this material for applications in super super absorbing applications. What about appearance? Uh, you see here to the left, you can color the material. The normal light brown color, you can easily change into white with a pigment, or you can make uh, semi-translucent films with red or green or whatever color. Uh, you can also choose to have a dull surface or as you see here, a, a glossy surface. And up here to the right, you have different color combinations. Uh, we actually took one of these uh, plates of gluten and went down to the gym and uh, we exposed it to 100 kilogram plus the, the, uh, the barbell here. And with a roughly 30% plasticizer, when you unload it, it will go back almost completely to the initial, initial shape. To the lower right here, there's a, there is what I call a puck. We, we actually been, been playing indoor hockey with it. With it. And we placed this material under a car, which is under the wheel, which is around 500 kilograms. Uh, and this is uh, uh, another example how, on, on how good properties you can get. And this is uh, the gluten plasticized with glycerol, which is a sugar. Uh, we have been making chairs out of, of gluten. This is a full scale uh, um, a chair. And if you take it outdoors, we made two ones, and the one we put outdoors looks like this to the right after seven months. Um, so you can have it to degrade readily, but if you keep it indoors in a, in a Scandinavian climate, there, there's no problem. Of, of, of it. it will it last for, we have plates now 15 years old or, or, or older with intact properties. Here's an example on the biodegradability of, of a hemp fiber reinforced wheat gluten. You can see that it, it uh, readily degrades. Um, that's what you would expect also. Now, if you don't want it to degrade too rapidly, this is essentially food. So you have microbes that can be a problem or mold. Um, and, but you can tackle that by adding uh, uh, chemicals to it. So you, you actually make it antimicrobial. Uh, we've been using, for example, uh, bromophenols are not something that is, is uh, that one looks at at the moment because of its problem. You don't want to use it. But this is actually a naturally occurring bromophenol, which is quite unstable, but, it's, but it has very good antimicrobial properties. So it's a na natural bromophenol. And it's also degradable since it's a natural one. I mentioned that uh, proteins are good gas barriers. This is an example where we, where the aim is to replace EVOH, which is expensive and fossil based. So if you put the wheat gluten as a middle layer and you protect it from moisture by having PLA on each side, you can actually get quite good oxygen barrier properties. Uh, we have recently started to work well since a few years on amyloid fibrils. So amyloid fibrils are formed naturally in the brain uh, and causing Alzheimer's disease. It forms plaques uh, or deposits. Um, and these are, so long threads are formed. And uh, uh, these type of things you can make in the lab. You can make these fibers in the fibers in the lab. You need a high temperature and a low pH, and essentially any protein you can start with. This is an example with whey proteins. So what happens at these conditions is that the protein forms long threads with mainly beta sheet structures, and which have improved strength. So what we have been doing here is that we. So it's, this is also an, uh, an example of an all all protein composite. So we take this amyloid fibrils and put it into a whey protein matrix. And you can see what happens to the 
stiffness as a function of the nanofibril concentration. So we are essentially uh, stiffening the material with, with this, its own uh, original material. Uh, what we also observed recently and we recently published is that proteins, for example, in the fo form of foams, are actually improving their properties in very harsh conditions. Here is an example of uh, a comparison of the different foams that we started with from the beginning. And then we treated the foam in a very harsh environment, up to one month at 150 degrees in air, a very, very harsh condition. And if you consider polyethylene or polystyrene foams, they immediately melt, of course, and then degrade within half a day or two days. The polyurethane sustains the, 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 um, uh, the uh, environment better, but poly polyurethane is very bad in terms of fire properties as compared to, for example, proteins. So these are two proteins, one with the plasticizer and one without. Of course, at 150, you will have a loss of plasticizer. But what we, have, what we realized was that the, this material improves its properties through this one month period. You can see the modulus and strength of the material as a function of time. And that's because the proteins form isopeptide bonds, as you see an example down here. So not only does it get stronger and stiffer, but it also becomes uh, uh, tol tolerant to uh, normal uh, solvents that you usually can dissolve this material in. So we're actually achieving a better and better material the, the, the longer we treat it at these high temperature conditions. This is something we will pursue further. Uh, so I, I end up here, it's around 15 minutes now, I think. Um, so uh, what about proteins and the future? So I've been working quite some time on these materials and, and uh, I think in the right condition, in the right environment, these are very good materials with a lot of, 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 of good uh, properties. Looking at protein materials is not really something new. Uh, um, Henry Ford in his T Ford uh, had actually soy proteins in different parts uh, of the car. Uh, you also have the, probably the oldest uh, packaging material, the, the covering, the, the skin of a sausage. It's often a glyceroplasticized collagen. And then you have gelatin capsules, for example. So in, in, in one way, this is not really new. Um, but, um, and I forgot to say, maybe the most important thing, these, does, these materials do not yield microplastics unless you, unless you uh, modify the material substantially. And that's a very big advantage nowadays of course so that's the end hey thank you Mikael very thank interesting you. and there's been a lot of questions also coming in uh, just one question for me for, first before I let the, the, the viewers in uh, the, one of the the problems that bioplastics industry has is that this discussion about making plastics out of food uh, material, so to say. Uh, but do you see that uh, this takes away any potential to, to produce food, that we use it for plastics instead, so to say? Yes, it can be, a bit depending on where in the world it's produced. Um, but with, it's interesting with, the, with respect to wheat gluten, since people are, don't want to have gluten in the food. Uh, I mean, there is more and more we are going more and more towards a gluten-free uh, food, uh, food market. And then the obvious thing would be to, to, to use it instead for, to, to make plastics, for example. And in Sweden, we can cultivate around 7% more land immediately if we need to make more uh, wheat for, for this reason. Um, so, so yeah, it can be a problem. That's the problem with PLA and the corn market in US. It's the problem with sugarcane, uh, making polyethylenes. So, so uh, um, yeah, but there are challenges for sure, but there are also a lot of possibilities. But that's, that's, um, that's one of the reasons, that's the reason that the, the bioplastic industry very hard is trying to get away from any raw material sources that could be seen as a food 
mm. material actually because yes. as i said before you can make bioplastics out of more or less anything it seems to mm. yeah <laughs> but, but but when you talked about gluten um there is a question i know there is one of the, the listeners here saying uh, um, if there is any risk for allergies if you use this kind of material for example in food packaging i got the, i got the question about that uh, half a year ago from the swedish gluten allergy association they are a little bit worried about this because it's so so small amounts of gluten that is needed to create the reaction in, in, in the human body yeah i know and i also been contacted some one person uh, was was talking about the uh, toothpaste tubes, for example, if you make them in gluten and, and of course, but first of all, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a doctor. So, but I think you need to digest it for, to, 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 to have problems with the celiac disease. Just touching it is, is, is not a concern, but in, for example, for food packaging and you have liquid food, you have to use it as a, as a middle layer. Uh, you have to, to have a, uh, something coat, uh, coated onto it. So it doesn't uh, go in contact with the food. That's probably, or you can have it as a package for dry foods, for, for, um, um, uh, yeah, uh, Kellogg's uh, brand or something. Right. I think we continue here. Uh, can we achieve transparent effect on protein plastics? Yeah, it's a matter on how thick you make the films. Um, the the wheat gluten often has this grayish or, or brown color, but for example, whey protein becomes completely transparent without any 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 color uh, when you when you use an, uh, an isolate like 93% protein which is available that that gives you complete transparent uh, they look like PMMA or polystyrene mm -hmm. uh, how was this material coated on the cardboard boxes those with the uh, KTH logo as shown in one of your slides Thanks. Yeah, they were coated. Uh, they were. They were. Uh, uh, they, these were actually press coated onto, laminated onto the paperboard. Right. Yeah. Regarding the fire resistance of the gluten materials, when you compare it to polyurethanes, were their polyurethanes loaded with were the polyurethanes loaded with flame retardants? Is the flame re retardancy of the proteins attributed to their nitrogen content? Uh, we used a two-component polyurethane. Uh, this was some time ago, but but and I don't think it was loaded with with flame retardants. But I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, the the flame resistance or f flame retardancy is due partly to that you, these materials contain some moisture. They can be maybe six percent on on a on a on a um, uh, relative on, on the normal relative relative humidity environment. So the moisture contributes to it. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's really the night. I, I cannot really answer that if it's really due to the nitrogen content. It forms a lot of char. And the reason for that is, I don't I have, a, have a fast answer on that. No, you can come back with that. Yeah. Uh, the last question, then we have to continue. Um, which applications was considered for the flax reinforced polymer composite uh, uh, for the formulations which flax was used to improve the strength? Thanks. We did not have any specific application in mind at that place. We, uh, at that time, we were just uh, trying to improve the strength of, of the, the material. But uh, yeah, so um, that's your imagination. You have to think, but but, but we, we were very focused on improving the strength. So we did not have any specific application in mind. Okay, the very last question here, because I think it's interesting. Which, which is the percentage of plastifier that we create microplastics? Uh, then is it biodegradable or compostable? I did not, can you repeat? I didn't fully understand. Which the is the percentage of plastifier that will create microplastics. Let's stop there because you said, I think you said if you fill a material with some additives yeah, or whatever. Yeah, if you, if you fill it, so, so we, we use glycerol as plasticizer mainly because it has turned out that molecules with three alcohol groups are very efficient plasticizers for, for polar polymers, very polar polymers as in this case. That's a sugar. 
uh, it's interesting because it's also a very big byproduct from uh, diesel production. So today one, one is looking for alternative uses of glycerol. That's of course biodegradable and does not create microplastics. So there, there, is no, there is no dependence on plasticizer content on the microplastic formation. This will not be a problem. The problem will be if you chemically uh, change the structure of the, of the polymer chains, which we have done in some, in some cases, then, then uh, you might see a, a change in the microplastic issues. Maybe it takes longer time for it to degrade and so on. But, but the, 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 the wheat gluten from the beginning with a sugar plasticizer, it's, this is food for, for this is nutrition. Uh, so, so uh, for the soil, for example. Okay, last question from me, and then we continue. Do you see, we, we see these materials out on the market, you think, as a bioplastic alternative? I think so. I, I'm not, I, I, I think so. In the right application, I'm, I'm sure we will see it. Uh, I, I see the potential of it, and I've seen it for several years. I think it goes very slow, though. Uh, too slow for me almost, I mean, I'm, I'm impatient, but yeah, I think so. I think we will see these materials uh, in the right applications. One has to consider the moisture sensitivity, but as you saw, you, if you coat the materials properly, that's, that's not an issue, for example. Okay, then I think we yeah. also have to speed up. So thank okay. you very much, Mika. Thank you and very much. There are more questions, you will, you will get them later, and then you can see if you like to answer them. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now we are going to talk a little bit about PLA, that is one of the, the most used bioplastics and the, maybe the, the single material that grows fastest uh, on the world market and new plants coming up, especially in Asia. Uh, we are going to listen to Yvonne Nygård, who is uh, Associate Professor Biology, Biology and Biological Engineering, Industrial Biotechnology. Wait, you must have a, a big business card with all that. Um, you're, you're going to talk about the microbial production of lactic acid towards sustainable PLA from wood. So Yvonne, please, the screen is yours. Thank you. You can see my screen, right? Yes. Yes, perfect. So good morning, everybody. My name is Yvonne Nygaard, and I'm going to talk about how microbes can be used for the production of lactic acid. But before that, I just want to briefly introduce uh, industrial biotechnology at Chalmers. So we are a division of uh, five principal investigators out of which I am one. The common theme of the research that we do is that we convert biomass into various products using either enzymes or microbes. So we utilize the biomass as such or the polymers in the biomass, the sugars, or even carbon dioxide and the products that we produce can be different materials. They can be chemicals, fine chemicals, speciality chemicals, or also bulk chemicals. We have also research on production of food and feed ingredients and even pharmaceuticals. And uh, there is some activities on production of biofuels as well. My own research is on making cell factories. And as I know that uh, there is a lot of uh, different backgrounds in the audience. I thought I'd start from the very basic, that what is a cell factory? It might sound uh, like a difficult terminology, but I'm sure most of you are familiar with this uh, yeast uh, here in the middle of the, of the slide. Yeast is a microorganism that is very commonly used for production of different beverages that we enjoy. What yeast does, it consumes sugars in different types of biomasses and then converts it into alcohol or other things of interest. There are many other organisms, microorganisms and yeast. There are bacteria, there are filamentous fungi, you name it. Many of these naturally produce different uh, chemicals, different compounds. Lactic acid that we're going to produce, uh, talk about today is produced uh, naturally by many bacteria, whereas yeast, that is the focus of my research, does not nat naturally produce lactic acid but is engineered, has been engineered already by others before. It's quite well established yeast can also be made to produce lactic acid. In the middle, you see a lot of medicines. Uh, this is also 
partly what uh, cell factories are, are today very commonly used for production of very high value compounds such as insulin is today commercially produced by yeast. So the way I like to look at microorganisms is that they are small factories, cell factories. Um, these cell factories, they take up biomass, they like carbohydrates. What they do is within the factories, the carbohydrates are then converted into compounds of interest. These can be organic acids such as lactic acid, or it can be anything else. A lot of antibiotics, uh, amino acids are produced in cell factories. What happens here in the cell factory is that different reactions take place, and it's the proteins that we just heard about, the proteins in the cell factory that make the, the reactions here, that convert biomass into products of interest. And using uh, through this process also, cellular energy is consumed and heat is generated. What my research is about is on genetic engineering, so improving the cell factories. How I like to think about it is that uh, you have the cell factory uh, has uh, a control room where all the information on how to store, just know how to run the factory is stored. And this is written in the DNA. What I do is I change the instructions, I change the DNA so that the metabolic fluxes uh, goes towards the product of interest and also so that more uh, substrates, more of uh, more uh, products can be can, uh, can be produced from more recalcitrant biomasses, for instance. So increasing the robustness, increasing the how how the cell factory works in different environments. Environments. So why do we do this? I'm sure many of you are familiar with these three blocks here in the left hand corner. These are some of the sustainability goals by UN. Uh, that we directly address in this research. What we want to do is provide means to have a, a more environmentally friendly production, less carbon dioxide, uh, uh, less uh, global warming. Uh, one way to tackle this is to use lignocellulosic biomass. Lignocellulosic biomass is then uh, biomass that is typically not utilized for food or feed application. So it's leftovers from agriculture or forestry industries. This still contains a lot of, of sugars, a lot of carbohydrates that could be utilized by different microorganisms. What we do is we put this lignocellulosic biomass into bioreactors, and then it is by the microbes converted to biofuels or biochemicals, in this case, lactic acid. So why lactic acid? Why are we interested in this? Well, we just heard that it's one of the, high, the most available uh, bioplastics today, polylactic acid. Uh, so lactic acid is the precursor, the raw material, what you then polymerize lactic acid, you get polylactic acid that is already today widely used in packaging, for instance. But lactic acid as such has also many other applications in food, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, or chemical application. Today, the commercial lactic acid is very commonly already produced by fermentation. And here there are lactic acid bacteria that are native producers. There are also yeast that have been engineered already earlier by others. And in addition to this, there is also chemical synthesis. I would still argue that the fermentation is a better option because it is quite simple. You can utilize these uh, low cost renewable feedstocks and you can also run the process under mild conditions such as low pressure and temperature, which then has uh, environmental benefits. About the growing market, uh, we see that polylactic acid is about uh, the one fourth of the application for lactic acid. The food and beverages is also huge. So we have to remember that the lactic acid is a precursor or is utilized in many different industries, not only for bioplastics. But if we look at the right hand side picture, we see that the lactic acid market, this is the US market, is really increasing year by year by millions of, of dollars. What we also see from here, what also uh, Wu just mentioned, is that the raw material for the lactic acid produced today is something, uh, are different crops that could be utilized for food and feed. So we, the industry today, we have the competition, we use corn or sugar canes for production of lactic acid. But in my research then, what I want to do is to go towards materials that are not typically considered as, as food. So these are non-edible site and waste streams. 
and uh, they can be sourced locally here in, in, in Sweden, for instance. And we envision that this is then a way to obtain improved economics if you could produce lactic acid as a byproduct uh, in, uh, for instance, the paper industry or any agriculture industry. It all sounds very good. There are, of course, challenges. Ch one challenge, obvious challenge, is that the biomasses are quite complex. And also they have varying composition depending on which biomass you utilize or even which season you harvest the biomass in. The lignocellulose biomass contains a lot of different sugars. Glucose, we all know that uh, both humans and microorganisms are very happy to consume. But then uh, there is a lot of other sugars where the xylose is the most abundant part in lignocellulose hydrolysates. Xylose is not readily utilized by most, most organisms. Then on top of that, when you hydrolyze biomass, you release compounds that are directly harmful for microorganisms. We call them inhibitors. So in my research, I focused on utilizing yeast for the production of, e of lactic acid. And why I have chosen to work with yeast is because even though yeast naturally cannot produce lactic acid, as already mentioned many times, it's rather easy to engineer la uh, lactic acid production in yeast. And yeast already has a very wide range of natural reactions, so it can metabolize a wide range of substrate. And it has been uh, made very efficient to uh, metabolize xylose as well. But maybe the most important reason why to work with yeast is that it has quite uh, good tolerance to hydrolysates and low pH. So low pH is uh, a very critical parameter as uh, when you produce an acid, then the, uh, you need to neutralize the reaction and that you typically do by adding of different calcium salts that then during the purification of lactic acid will form gypsum. And this leads to a lot of cost then for, for the actual production. So you would like to produce at low pH so that less neutralizers can be added. So let's look at the metabolism now very high level of yeast. This is uh, a yeast taking up glucose, which is the preferred substrate. Glucose is converted into carbon dioxide and ethanol to a set of different reactions. So this happens in all yeast, uh, native yeast. They produce ethanol, they produ produce carbon dioxide. Um, there is one intermediate that is very important here, that is pyruvate, because pyruvate is the precursor for lactic acid. And by a simple addition of a lactate dehydrogenase gene, we can make yeast into a cell factory for production of lactic acid. Let's talk a bit about uh, lignocellulose and the challenge of that. I already mentioned that when lignocellulose is broken down or hydrolyzed, when you make lignocellulosic hydrolysates, what is released is not only the sugars that the yeast can easily ferment, but also small compounds that may be very harmful for, for the cell. These are inhibitors. These inhibitors, they cause a lot of stress, both stress uh, in terms of low pH, in terms of oxidative stress, and they need to, the cells need to contract this, and this costs energy, causes uh, ATP, and eventually it can also lead to a decrease in viability and decrease in growth. And the outcome of this is that you don't have as much production as you would have. So the production is, is hindered or hampered by the toxicity of, of these inhibitors. So my research has been on understanding the stress tolerance and also increasing the robustness of yeast in order to improve yeast as a cell factory. And how we do this, we typically employ the so-called design, build, test, learn cycle. You can see that this is an iterative cycle, so you can always get better. Uh, what you start is here at the design. What is the problem? What is it that you want to solve? Is it something new that you want to produce? Is it a new raw material that you want to convert? And after you have done the design, then we build strains. So by genetic engineering, I'm sure some of you have heard about the CRISPR-Cas scissor. Uh, this is a revolutionary tool where we can speed up genetic engineering of, of cell factories. We utilize, utilize this in the lab to build different strain variants. Then comes the maybe most important part, the testing, testing the strains. Do they work as we envision? How is the production influenced by the building that we did? And finally, we learn, learn from what we get so that uh, we'll learn from uh, the different parameters, the different results that we get. And then we utilize this to improve the cell factories even further. 
So let's start looking into some data, uh, some data on characterization of the lactic acid production strain we are working with. We wanted the strain to be able to grow on xylose because uh, xylose is an abundant sugar in these biomasses and does not compete with the uh, use for, for food and feed. Our strain that we chose to work with, it grows very well both on xylose, on glucose or, and in media with, when glucose and xylose are both present. Then we also wanted a strain that works well at low pH. And we can see that when the pH gets very low, then there is less biomass being produced. So the growth is slower, but our strain that we work with is tolerant to pHs above three, which is already very good. Then we also looked into the inhibitors. Uh, what the most common in, or most abundant, most stressful inhibitor in the lignocellus hydrolysate is acetic acid. And we checked that our strain is rather tolerant to acetic acid as well. It tolerates about four and a half grams per liter of acetic acid. And this is within the range of what is typically found in, in hydrolysates. Then another parameter that comes, becomes very obvious uh, when you want to produce lactic acid is the tolerance towards lactic acid. Does the lactic acid itself cause harm to the cells? So we added lactic acid to the cells and we looked at how they grow when we increase the conditions. The, the, the concentrations. We see that uh, lower concentrations does not affect growth at all, but then when we go up to really high concentrations, then the growth is impaired. Still, our organism is quite tolerant, tolerant to more than 50 grams a liter of lactic acid it can still handle. What we also noticed that uh, when we have engineered our strain to produce lactic acid, we simply add this one reaction we also get lactic acid consumption of over time. So we add lactic acid to the medium and then we measure that throughout the time and it actually disappears. So this is not that good. So this is one of the things that uh, we have focused on when developing the strain further because the lactic dehydrogenase is a reversible reaction. So when there is less carbon, when uh, the cells continue to grow, they will also consume the lactic acid and then uh, for, for growing further. So we want to, we want to address this. We, of course, want to produce lactic acid and not consume it. Let's go back to see what we actually do to make yeast produce lactic acid. In all its simplicity, we use the CRISPR-Cas technology, the tool to cut the DNA, cut and paste DNA. We paste a lactic dehydrogenase gene, a gene uh, that comes from another organism. It can be a bacterial organism or, or origin, for instance, bacteria that uh, natively produce lactic acid, they would have a lactic dehydrogenase. So this can be then copied and pasted into yeast. And thus yeast get the, the capability to produce lactic acid when it is grown. What we do in the labs is we start with these small shake flask cultures. And the first step is to really look at, do we have any production of lactic acid at all? We run a standard, we run like pure lactic acid. We look at our control strain, it does not produce and our strain of interest, it indeed produces some lactic acid. So this was a very good starting point. And let's look at the data. Uh, our strain was characterized then for lactic acid production at different pH. This is how the strains grow. So even at the pH, low pH, when they produce lactic acid at pH 3, they still grow, even though it's a bit slower than at higher pH. What we can see here in the lactic acid titer at different pH is that we eventually do get roughly the same amount of lactic acid. So that's about 20 grams a liter from 20 grams a liter of xylose. But also, even at low pH, we do get the production. Here, the production is just slower, but it may have to do with that the growth simply is slower. So we have done quite a lot of work on improving the lactic acid production by then doing uh, more uh, uh, genetic engineering of the strain and optimizing the conditions. What we see when we do these uh, experiments in flasks is that when we produce a lot of lactic acid, the pH goes down, so the conditions get more acidic over time. We looked at three different strains, um, increased the xylose concentration, thought that yeah, maybe increasing high xylose concentration, we get more lactic acid to some content extent we did, but we ended up with about 25 grams a liter, even though we had uh, 60% or six, 60 grams a liter of xylose in the media. So it was not yet optimal. And we speculated that actually higher pH, uh, keeping the pH higher would increase the production. And this is what we see when we buffered the pH, we managed to produce up to 
44 grams a liter of lactic acid. So before ending, I still want to uh, briefly say something about ongoing work or putting this in the scope. This is part of work uh, on co-production of lactic acid and Vaxester. This is a project that I run together with researchers at Tampere University. The whole idea is that we would not only produce lactic acid, but we would also produce a more high value compound, which is Vaxester. Vaxesters can be produced from lignin, with a bacteria called Acidinobacter bailey, which is the expertise of uh, the research group in Tampere University, led by, by Santala Group. Sorry. So in this project, what we want to do is to optimize the co-production of lactic acid and vaxesters to put our yeast that produces lactic acid together with the Acidinobacter uh, that can then utilize the lignin and also detoxify the material for us in order then to have a more complete uh, utilization of the biomass. And another project that uh, we have already done quite some work on, published part of it, and this is still ongoing, is on work on developing biosensors for acid monitoring. So these are genetic biosensors. They are genetic constructs that uh, react to target molecules. These target molecules are then acids. So if there is acid present in the media or if the cells produce acid, then the cells report that by a fluorescent signal. In, very, in all its simplicity, they get green. So uh, you can measure the production or measure the, uh, acidic, uh, the acid concentration to the color intensity of the cells. What we saw uh, when we developed the biosensor for acidic acid is that uh, it uh, shows a linear response. The biosensor shows a linear response to up to 60 millimolar of acidic acid. And currently, we're working on optimizing the biosensor and also changing its specificity so that we could use it for sensing other acids and use it for screening for production purposes. So here, the idea is that uh, if you introduce a biosensor into a library of strains, so different strains, they have been genetically engineered to be different, or maybe they, they have been mutagenized to be different so that you want but the idea is that you want to screen for something that has an improved production. So what we do is we put in the biosensor and then we sort the different strains based on their fluorescence. And the fluorescence is then relative to how the strains would produce. And this way we can screen hundreds or even thousands of cells through different methodologies such as PUCs. Okay. So I want to finish with some uh, brief take home messages. I hope I have uh, convinced you that lactic acid can efficiently be produced with yeast at low pH and that xylose rich biomass is a potential raw material for lactic acid production. And finally, biosensors, I believe are very valuable tools for monitoring and also improving engineering the tolerance of strains and also the production. So with that, uh, I will finish by acknowledging the people who have done the work. So Bo Yun Choi is a postdoc in my group. He has uh, produced most of the data on the, on the lactic acid production strain that I cho chose. And Mauricio Mormino is the PhD student of mine working on the biosensors. And this is in collaboration with Verena Sievers. The group in Tampere is led by Suvi Santala, and there is a PhD student called Shangshu Liu who works on this. And of course, I'm very grateful for the funding agencies for enabling this, this work. So thank you. I would be very happy to take any questions. Yes, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, right now, I'm very happy that we have a lot of viewers that are putting questions because uh, this is not easy for me since I'm not a scientist or a researcher becomes very complicated to put the right questions, but we do have some questions here from the audience. So let's see, uh, here's one saying, have you done any work on production of lactic acid from household food waste? Uh, for example, as a treatment step prior to biogasification composting? The very simple answer is no, I have not. <laughs> uh, we have in other research looked into different uh, biomasses, different raw materials. We know that our yeasts, uh, they are tolerant to different biomasses. It really depends on what 
treatment, what pre-treatment you that you have before you then feed the biomass to the microorganisms. But I think that there is a lot of room for improvement here. What you need to have is a stream that is abundant enough so that it makes sense, and also that it is stable enough so that you can trust that uh, uh, you can work with it. Household food waste, I think here is rather challenging, but yeah, that does not mean it's not doable. The other thing is that when you then produce lactic acid, you also need to purify it from the broth. So then I'm not a chemist, but I know that there are a lot of chemists that struggle with how do you get the lactic acid out of the fermentation broth in order to then purify it, in order to polymerize it so that you can make PLA out of it. Okay, another question. Uh, Non-food sources for lactic acid and fatty acid does also exist in anaerobic water treatment plants, but are there any uh, R&D how to extract these from this wastewater soap? Yes, this is also not my expertise. I know uh, very well that uh, in wastewater treatment plants, there are many different organic acids that are produced. There is a lot of ongoing research if you could actually produce something of value. So here, I guess that the, the what you point out, the purification, here you talk about a lot of volumes and the production titers may be very low. So you need a very efficient method to take them out uh, and uh, how to do that in a cost efficient manner. I think here there is a lot of room for improvement, but for sure there is R&D going on in this field as well. Okay, and here's another one. Um, how far developed is the lactic acid acid production from other C5 sugars, uh, such as arabinose? Um, I, there has been some research done on that. Arabinose is typically not that abundant in the biomasses we have worked on, so we have not engineered the arabinose utilization route, but there are yeasts that are rather efficient in utilizing arabinose as well. So of course, this is just the start. The whole idea would be that you utilize all the different sugars so in, in introducing the Arabinos pathway would be the logical next step. Uh, let's see, how is this process different from the production of PHA and PHB? Well, um, PHA and PHB are both polymers. So there you already produce the precursors that go together into a polymer. And that is usually an insoluble polymer that stays in to, inside the cell. So here, one of the main difficulties is to how to break up the cells so that you can release these polymers that can be utilized then for bioplastics uh, production. And this is different in the yeast because they produce then lactic acid, which is a chemical that can get out of the cell. So you don't have to sacrifice the cell. You don't have to break the cell open in order to harvest the lactic acid from the media. And then the polymerization happens only later on through chemical methods. Next question. Can the genetic modification be used to improve process window? Can the genetic modification be used? Yeah, yeah. Can, can uh, the genetic modification be used to improve process window? Gen modifying in Swedish, I think. Yeah, but to improve what process? The process window, it says here. It, uh, yeah, I don't understand quite what you mean with process window. <laughs> I don't understand it either, but that's a question from the from the audience. So what we have been doing is uh, to use genetic modification to improve both the tolerance of the strains towards these uh, lengthened biomasses to improve the production so that you produce higher titers or productivities that you produce more per time unit. Uh, the window, if I'm speculating what it may be, uh, the window of opportunity, what kind of raw materials you could utilize. That can also be influenced by then genetic engineering. So for instance, arabinose was, was just mentioned. If you want to utilize arabinose, then you need to genetically engineer the strains to be able to convert arabinose. They don't naturally do that. Okay. Two more questions, then we have to continue. Is a uh, nitro source required for the fermentation of silos? If so, which you have been using? Yes, so nitrogen in general is required for cells, regardless of whether uh, they ferment silos or something else. So when we use pure media, we do add that, and that can be then in ammonia or urea, we have tested a few. But the good thing with hydrolysates is, is that that is really hydrolyzed biomass, so there is nitrogen already there, so then you don't need to add an extra nitrogen source. And the last one. 
uh, is the yeast producing lactic acid out of the cell or do you need to break the cell to get the LA out uh, as a product? Yeah, so it is produced out of the cells, but this is very much one of the challenges as well to get it efficiently exported out of the cells. But what we do is we harvest it from the media, so we don't break the cells, but this is one of the research that we do is how to improve the export. Okay, Yvonne, I think we, there are some more questions, so I will let you know them later on also, but I think we have to stop here to keep the time schedule. So thank you very much. I think there's a great interest. Thank, thank you. you. So uh, Nordic Bioplastic Organization is a Nordic organization as the name says. So we are going to move over to, to Norway now and uh, meet uh, Erik uh, Juner, who is professor at Norwegian Institute of Bioeconomy Research. And um, he's going to talk about degrade, the degradation of biodegradable plastics in soil and waste streams. And I think this is an interesting topic in many ways because there's a lot of discussions about uh, uh, biodegradable uh, plastics and uh, composting and all that, and especially done on the continent and uh, newly on the big European bioplastics meeting in Berlin that this was one of the main topics actually. And um, the, the bioplastics industry has a problem, especially when it comes to packaging that at least the politicians believe that uh, if, 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 if we see it, if you see that it says bioplastics on, on the package, we think we can throw it in the, in the nature anywhere and, and it will be the grade. And of course, that's not true. Uh, and I don't know actually how the, the, the politicians uh, come up with this idea because I have never seen anyone who is reading on the package what kind of material it is before they throw it away. So I think uh, uh, this is just something they believe will happen. But nevertheless, let's uh, let Mr. Erik Juner in and the screen is yours. Thank you. Uh, let's see if I can share properly here. Is it in the full screen mode now? Can you see it? It's the presentation mode so far. So I think oh, I'm... that didn't work then. Let's see what's happening here. There, no, there you're back on, on the, the one you had. <laughs> Let's see if we can make it. Uh, this now that probably got worse. Let's see. Let's try in a different way here. No problem. Take it easy. There you are. Perfect. Then it looks yep. okay. Good. Yep, absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I will uh, present uh, some research results from uh, a project on uh, biodegradable plastic mulch, uh, uh, which we have started a couple of years ago and uh, which is uh, coming to this end of life uh, topic that was uh, demanded uh, from some of the people in the chat, let's see, no, it's not uh, moving here. Ah, there, let's see. So um, the background for this talk is, of course, the, the societal demand for uh, replacement of conventional plastics with biodegradable products. Uh, the, also the increased focus on, on recycling of uh, waste and uh, soil as a recipient of this waste. Uh, the public is also quite concerned about the uh, contamination by plastic and the fragmentation of plastic. So this has a lot of uh, focus from the from the public. And um, here up in Scandinavia and in Norway in particular, we have a quite cold climate uh, where organic matter is degrading very slowly in soil. So uh, this uh, translates to uh, the problem of uh, how pro products that are presumably developed for use in a warmer climate is performing uh, here up in the north. So just uh, most of you are probably not very familiar with soil, but uh, soil is one of our topics. Um, we used to be an agricultural institute. And now we're dealing with many types of bioeconomy resources and uh, soil agriculture recycling 
pollution uh, degradation and so on is, is uh, our main research topics and, and to understand what happens with these things when they enter into soil we need to know uh, a little bit about the basic properties of soil. Um, Scandinavian soils compared to uh, more Mediterranean soils have a very high content of organic matter or humus as you might call it so about five and a half percent of, of the soil matrix is composed of organic matter in uh, in Norway. In the Mediterranean regions uh, this is only this is down to only one third, which is uh, quite a lot less. And uh, this is not because we do things very differently when it comes to agriculture, but uh, it's because the temperature uh, further south is uh, leading to enhanced degradation rates of plant plant residues and, and other inputs. So uh, actually, if you take a, a sampler uh, or a logger and put it in Norwegian soil a few centimeters below the surface, you will measure an average temperature of about five degrees uh, throughout the year. Uh, of course, it fluctuates, but the average is about five degrees. And the peak soil temperatures is uh, not much higher than 15 degrees. So when it comes to this uh, topic of uh, degrading biodegradable films, uh, it's uh, the, the prescribed way to use it is, of course, then to cover the soil, uh, cultivate the plants, and at the harvest you 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 till uh, and uh, shred the plastics into the soil, and it's uh, supposed to degrade there within a certain time. And uh, this time span is is what is uh, crucial for the project that we have. Uh, uh, that I'm presenting here and uh, the, the standards for these uh, plastic materials is that they are supposed to degrade within two years uh, at the temperature of around 25 degrees. Um, the project, the degrade is a three year project uh, funded by the Norwegian Research Council led by a colleague of mine called Claire Kutris and, and five uh, partners that you can see at the bottom of the, the page. Uh, the, the main topics of uh, the project is to look at uh, these biodegradable films, which I will talk mainly about today, and also about other biodegradable plastics during composting. This is typically PLA and CPLA, uh, but also, also plastic wrapping for uh, magazines or uh, shopping or whatever. And uh, finally, there is a part uh, dealing with life cycle uh, analysis, which I will not talk about today at all. Um, we were interested then in uh, looking at how uh, biodegradable plastic films uh, degradation is affected by soil temperature, climatic conditions, soil type, soil organic matter content, soil depth, etc. And to investigate this, we selected three locations in the southern Norway uh, with two farms on each location uh, doing vegetable production. And uh, we buried uh, mesh bags with nylon uh, mesh bags with uh, with uh, biodegradable films at uh, two different depths uh, at each site, and uh, proceeded to collect these uh, mesh bags and and look at the degradation rates of the plastics after 10, 20, 52, and 104 weeks. So far, the the, the real proper analysis of the materials have not been done from any or for more than the, the two first harvests. Uh, so those are the ones I'm going to present here. The field sites are located uh, close to Oslo in, in Drammen, uh, close to Grimsta on the south, south uh, east part of uh, Norway, and close to Stavanger, uh, which has a, a warmer uh, winter at least, and, uh, but uh, not very different summer climates. And uh, as you can see here, we, we proceeded by burying these small uh, nylon mesh bags uh, in, in soil in, uh, in the cultures where the bioplastics were used. Different type of production, but uh, mainly uh, lettuce and uh, also uh, kale and, uh, and celery was, uh, was cultivated. 
the materials we used were two, the two main biodegradable uh, films available in Norway uh, when we started, uh, one from Biobag and one from Erlemans, both at uh, 12 micron thickness. Uh, and uh, we enclosed them in these mesh bags of nylon, uh, packing a 20 by 20 centimeter square into a, a small ball and, uh, and uh, welding this uh, nylon mesh bag to contain it. Uh, we have uh, tested this and, and uh, can see that uh, all these materials listed to the right can enter into the mesh bags like uh, uh, soil materials like uh, clay, silt and fine sand, bacteria, fungi, plant roots and uh, small soil animals, microfauna and juvenile mesophyma. Uh, this is a little bit how the setup looked at, at each farm. So we, we buried uh, the two types at two different uh, depths and uh, replicated this uh, four times for four consecutive harvests. And we uh, repeated this uh, three times for, for experimental uh, replicates. And then we buried some temperature loggers uh, along with uh, the, the pouches. And then we gradually removed them. Uh, and. Uh, uh, looking at the, the temperature at these different uh, farms, uh, the average temperature during the five months that we uh, assessed, so the, the summer months, was uh, around 15 to 17 degrees. You can see it from the different farms, different sites, uh, pretty much the same uh, for, the, for the three sites. Um, when we uh, dug up this, we could then uh, open the mesh bags and, and uh, find all these uh, uh, roots, bacteria, columbola, enchytrides, uh, etc. These organisms, uh, could, we could uh, we can detect them and, uh, and quantify them inside the mesh bags. When we looked at uh, the degradation, we uh, I, I will only present here the, the mass loss of the plastic film uh, after uh, two and a half and five months uh, for the different farms and the different uh, type of, of plastics. As, uh, and as you can see here, the, the, the most we could see of uh, degradation was, uh, was around the 10, uh, 9 to 13%. So not enormously during uh, an entire uh, growth season, but uh, yeah, the, the bio bag performed a little bit better than the Orleman's uh, film uh, in most cases. The pouches, when we, uh, when we excavated them and, and cleaned them, we could clean, clearly see that there were uh, fragments in, uh, inside the mesh bags and we, we uh, opened them and, and quantified this then. Similar for the farm in uh, the southeast uh, uh, coast of Norway, uh, even less degradation for, from compared to the farm close to Oslo. And finally, at, uh, close to Stavanger, also degradation rates that uh, resemble a bit what we saw in, uh, in Viken around a maximum of 10% uh, after, uh, after five months. You can uh, see again how the, the plastic appears here when, when we take it out from the, the pouch and uh, the, there is clearly some fragmentation going on and, and, and uh, degradation has started, but uh, it's far from, uh, far from efficient. Uh, we also did some composting experiments. This is uh, PLA drinking uh, glasses from music festivals that are recycled by a uh, waste company that we collaborate with. Uh, we use the same mesh bag technique, uh, but here we also fill these pouches with the compost. So there is, a, there is about 5% of uh, PLA, uh, shredded PLA inside this and 95% of compost. And, and they are buried in a, in a windrow composting, uh, uh, standard composting with the, with the mixture of uh, garden waste and uh, and uh, food waste and uh, they're buried and then uh, the, these pouches were uh, pulled out uh, weekly for a chase period of uh, eight weeks 
uh, this little bit how it looked inside the, the pouches when they were uh, dug up after only uh, a week uh, or two here. And uh, eventually after five weeks, we, there were only uh, five to seven weeks that the, the plastics, the PLA looked like these very small um, parts that could be uh, the only thing we could extract from that. So uh, the degradation of the PLA uh, was relatively quick, especially under these industrial conditions when temperatures were reaching between 60 and 70 degrees. We also tested these uh, CPLA cutleries in, in smaller compost bins, but uh, with uh, temperature logging and temperatures reaching 70 degrees. And uh, to fragment, uh, we needed some uh, physical uh, breaking of it and uh, but then after about uh, 10 days they were uh, they were pretty well degraded uh, what we added of uh, this uh, waste bags uh, labeled industrial okay compost uh, also degraded uh, relatively fast in, in hot composting while the okay the home okay compost you can even see the label here after incubation in the compost for one year uh, they don't degrade at all, it seems, and they don't degrade very much even in hot composting. We have tested this in at 60, uh, 60 65 degrees, and uh, they, they don't degrade much there, unfortunately. So conclusions from this work is uh, partially that this mesh bag method uh, permits uh, material recovery and quantification of uh, fragmentation and mass loss for, for these films. Uh, it's, uh, it's a system which uh, permits the entry of water, soil particles, roots or biota, etc., into the mesh bag, but it probably slows down the degradation rates compared to uh, a single layer of plastic uh, being incubated directly into soil. Uh, we are uh, planning to, to try to compare these two degradation methods for shorter uh, periods of time to see if we can uh, we can find a, a sort of a, a transformation or a, a ratio between uh, the proper soil incubation and mesh bag incubation. Uh, the degradation that we did observe, however, was very low, not more than one to 13% during a, a growth season. And uh, we're not expecting that much to happen during the winter season where temperatures are substantially lower. Uh, but we're now uh, treating the, the 52 weeks and we will harvest this year the 104 week treatment. Uh, the rele relevant time frame here is of course two to three years. Uh, so the, these uh, final harvests will give us better answers to, to our questions. PLA and CPLA and waste bags degrade the, the well. We can see that in, in industrial type composting, but uh, the, the, so the, the so called home compost is uh, not degrading either in home composts or in, in uh, rather uh, harsh, uh, high temperature compost. So, um, what we are going to continue to work on is. Uh, is uh, this aspect of uh, how biodegradable plastics work in some situations, but not in others. We're, we're trying to produce some, some advice here for authorities and, and users. Um, we do uh, <laughs> already see that this nonsense applications damage the, the biodegradable sector. It's, it's not very wise to label something with the biodegradable for home composts and, and people will observe that they remain intact a year after they have put them into their own compost. So, so this is uh, creating a sort of a trust deficit for, for, this, for this domain. And uh, that's something you as an organization need to take uh, <laughs> ownership of. Uh, we also see that these certifications sometimes uh, are used to sell non degradable products under false flag, and that's that's also damaging for your domain of, uh, of business. So uh, you, you should ensure that it doesn't happen. But then again, materials are developing continuously, and, and I hope you have solutions to this uh, appearing pretty soon. Uh, our focus uh, for research uh, now is uh, uh, 
partially on uh, biodegradable waste bags that are entering biogas treatment plants, where they are, of course, not degraded because they are supposed to be de degraded at high temperature when, uh, when they actually degrade. And, uh, but there is maybe a, a solution there that we are working with these uh, biogas plants uh, together with them. We were testing the possibility of separating out the, the solids and composting this uh, prior to, to use in, uh, in soil products or in agriculture. Another topic that we are starting to research is uh, the comparison of conventional versus biodegradable plastics as vectors for pollutants, because uh, some pollutants adsorb or are even contained in, in biodegradable plastics and conventional plastics. And the question is, how does the degradation uh, affect release and exposure of uh, soil organisms, for example, for this, these pollutants? Um, finally, I have I'm not find the good English word for yattesuk, but it's uh, it's my my request to, to you as a, as a business domain. Uh, try to avoid bioplastics. This is uh, this is not very smart word, except I can realize that it's very difficult to find something that groups biodegradable plastics and bio based plastics that are not biodegradable. And uh, if you find a good name for the plastics that are both bio-based and biodegradable, you will be very well off. Then people will start uh, understanding what to do with plastics. One of the things that we see now together with the plastic recyclers in Norway is that they are really afraid of biodegradable plastics because as little as uh, one to 2% of biodegradable plastics mixed into conventional plastics that are supposed to be recycled destroys the recycling pro process. So they, they look at uh, your growth uh, with dread and uh, unless we can keep these uh, resource streams apart, there are going to be conflicts. So beware of this, but I'm quite sure you're aware of this already. So I think I'll just uh, thank you for the attention then, and uh, I can take some questions. Okay, thank you. This is very interesting, I think, absolutely. Um, uh, this home uh, oh, compost, okay, what, 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 who is producing them? Who is certifying that? I mean, this is this TÜV uh, approval, which is somehow originating from Austria, I think, but uh, I, it's... I know yeah. that, I know that the, the company, yes. Yes, and this is the, the stamp that is used in many countries. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the plastic film you saw there that was not degradable uh, was... Uh, wrapping of a French magazine. I've been living in France for uh, many years and uh, still receive some mail from there. And of course, they, they don't say anything about the, the producer. Uh, they, uh, they have just labeled this to, to sort of greenwash their own activity. And uh, this, is, this is damaging for, uh, for uh, the reputation of biodegradable plastics. So, uh, Awesome. But uh, these are things that you probably know much more about than me. So, so I hope that uh, I can just uh, put this problem in your lap, and uh, so do, do I will you, I will check the new products coming out of your activity. <laughs> do Do you think that the, the, those products have actually been tested by TÜV, or is it just some, that someone is using their their logos? Um, I mean, you, you see a lot of things coming from Asia, for example, where they say it's biodegradable, but it's not. So the it that could be one problem, but uh, yeah, I guess there are uh, people uh, keeping an eye on fraud when it comes to labeling. Uh, I mean, if you buy a, a Gucci bag and, and it's not made by Gucci, you will have somebody on your neck. Uh, yeah. it, it should be the same with uh, biodegradable uh, plastic uh, being labeled as, uh, as such. But uh, then, of course, the, the, the practices in different countries are, uh, are different, and, and this is not uh, standardized through Europe, as far as I know. Because it would surprise me if a serious company like TÜV would uh, have, have put this certification on this product and it doesn't degrade at all. That would surprise me, actually. 
I think uh, producers, of course, uh, try to comply to these standards that are put by, by TUV and that they are doing their own tests. Uh, maybe their process is uh, changing during production or maybe they test a certain film thickness and they uh, put the same stamp on other thicknesses because it's the same material. There can be issues like that, but this, of course, is uh, is, uh, uh, is a uh, juridic uh, yes, yes. aspect, and, and uh, this is way out of my uh, area of competence. So. Yeah, but, but enough with me now. I think we have a lot of questions for you. We take some of them. Uh, let's see here. Did you make the analysis of microplastics in the soil or in the microbiota? How the microbiota of the soil was affected after the process? We are conducting microbiological uh, analysis of these materials, but uh, the, the, there is not likely to be an eff a detrimental effect uh, on, for example, biomass or activity. On the contrary, as we learned from the last speaker, this is food for microorganisms. So, so if they can degrade this, they will multiply and uh, we we don't foresee any negative effects on at least on soil microbiota for, for for larger organisms eating this, it's probably not an, uh, a problem either. Uh, the material in itself is not toxic. If there is anything toxic in this, it would be additives. But uh, then again, there is uh, there is not much uh, of toxic additives uh, either that uh, that are acutely toxic, and uh, the dilution that uh, takes place during degradation with the, the surrounding environment is, is going to, to make detection of negative effects very difficult. So, so the, I think the main issue here is not the uh, negative effects of biodegradable plastics on, uh, on soil organisms. Uh, it's more a question, uh, I, there I think the, the conventional plastics is far worse. If you use, for example, sewage sludge on agricultural soil, and you have uh, loads of uh, uh, synthetic fibers from uh, washing clothes and so on that, uh, that enter into the soil, this will enter organisms. And, and since they are not degradable, they may cause problems. But uh, the biodegradable part is, uh, is probably not causing any problems. So yeah, the, um, we, we haven't, uh, we haven't uh, done the, the full microbiological analysis here, but we, what we expect to see is a change in community composition. When they get a new substrate, certain bacteria and fungi uh, will proliferate compared to others because they have a preference for this uh, biodegradable substrate uh, as food. Um, let's see here. Composting of PLA does it end up in any microplastics or is it totally degraded? I mean, uh, when it's fully composted, uh, we don't find traces of it. But of course, this is an extremely dirty matrix to, to sample and to uh, pick out true microplastics. I mean, today microplastics is defined between five millimeters, which is visible, and uh, 100 nanometers. Uh, so. Uh, anything that is uh, smaller than uh, a few hundred microns is uh, very difficult to to extract and uh, analyze, and uh, particularly in dirty matrices like uh, soil and and compost. What we did was, of course, trying to contain this in the in the mesh bags. Soil is entering there, and we have a, a far higher concentration of the plastics in that situation than we would have in a bulk soil sample where this would be diluted even further. But uh, what it appears like from the composting is that before the composting process is over, the, the PLA is completely degraded. And I think this is about oxo, oxo plastics. What do you think about additives like breakdown plastics, adding biodegrad biodegradability features to plastics? I mean, that's not uh, allowed in, in Western Europe. I think you have to go to the Eastern part like uh, Russia and those parts where they use oxo degradable materials. Yeah, we have not looked at oxo either because it's yeah. not in, in Norway. So uh, this is, uh, but I, I agree that oxo was a bad idea. 
<laughs> yeah, I think so, because there you really have microplastics. It doesn't degrade totally. It just breaks no. down the material. Yes. Yeah. Um, you, you were talking a little bit about recycling, so I don't think. But will uh, Nibio also study other materials than solely PLA and slash CPLA? Uh, yes, we are uh, we are the, studying the PBAT and uh, some of the other uh, materials. And of course, we also have activities on uh, conventional polyethylene, uh, polypropylene, etc. So, so we are uh, we are looking at uh, a range of different uh, uh, materials, and and when we get uh, uh, samples like from biogas digestate or from sewage sludge uh, and uh, recover particles there, we do uh, we do uh, FTIR micro FTIR analysis and. Uh, uh, some pyrolysis uh, GCMS to, to identify the materials and we can find, of course, uh, a range of other materials there. Uh, but uh, our focus is usually on the, on the big, uh, on, the, on, on those with the highest volumes. And uh, according to the material or the type of recycling uh, stream that we're studying, we, we tend to focus on, on uh, the few uh, quantitatively most important ones. Right. Well, we have a lot of more questions for you, but uh, the time is running out, unfortunately. So I will send them to you and you can answer. I can end with this. Someone is saying, Bravo, Erik. Biodegradable is not the same that, that be, than bio-based. And that's, uh, that's what we know, also, of course, in, in the business, that it's not the same. And that's the big problem, I think, to, to get people to understand that just because it says bio, it's not the same as biodegradable. And that's what I was talking about in the beginning before your speech here. Yeah, oh, this is, it's sad that uh, people have so little interest in educating themselves on such uh, key material to our uh, daily life and, and how, how absolutely uninterested they are in the waste stream. They, uh, this is, uh, this is frustrating, but uh, I think the way forward is uh, labeling, 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 bigger yes. and bigger until, I mean, they look like cigarette packets uh, with, the, with this death yes. warning. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Eric, we, we have to stop here. It's, as I said, there is at least 10, 15 more questions, but there's no time for that. So I will try to address them if you forward okay. them. Okay, so, yeah. good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, we are to the last speaker. And we are going to listen to Mr. Mikael Skrivvars from the University of Borås, uh, the Faculty of Textiles, Engineering and Business. And I think, uh, Mikael, I think you are finished from the origin, but I don't know if you're living in Borås. But when we talked before this, you had a, a Finnish background, I think. So maybe you can explain that. that then we have covered Finland also <laughs> in this wow. Nordic slide. Well, well, thank you, thank, thank you very much for for the introduction. Also, indeed, I'm I'm I'm, I'm from Finland, but uh, got my education in Finland. But I'm professor in polymer technology here in in at University of Gross. But maybe I don't need to go in the more in, into the <laughs> to that uh, uh, what it means to be a Finn in Sweden. But uh, that's another question. Um, so. Um, First of all, I really would like to thank you for, for inviting me to this very important and very interesting uh, workshop. And also, I think that the, 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 this Nordisk Bioplast Vereining is really something that is, is needed. I'm really happy for your work. And also, I would like to, I think the, the previous presentations by the other in the, this morning were very, really, really very interesting. And, and also, especially, I would like to agree with Eric about this terminology when we talk about bioplastics it's uh, it is a little bit confusing because there are actually several uh, different uh, types of of uh, of what you could call bioplastics and as you see my, my talk is titled bioplastics and biocomposites new material solutions for sustainability and actually what i will talk about or use, uh, use uh, the terminology will be biopolymer because that is more general and, and that is, is, uh, is more, more um, clear what it means uh, when we talk about a biopolymer. So, and also my, my presentation is, is more on a general level. Uh, I will not go into the details as the previous uh, speakers uh, into uh, really the detailed research. I, I will, I will, 
address that uh, briefly, but uh, I will uh, more talk about some general the general issues and 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 uh, based on my experience with with uh, bioplastics biocomposites biopolymers and so on um, so uh, oops so here is the, the outline so i will talk about first about the sustainability challenge for polymer materials then uh, about the new economies that we have sort of for material management the circular economy and bioeconomy then about the biopolymers, uh, so opportunities and challenges. Um, finally, shortly about uh, what we offer here in 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 uh, universe in Buros uh, regarding polymer research, and then uh, finally some some conclusions. Uh, so. Uh, <clears throat> So the sustainability challenges for polymer materials, uh, and then here I, I uh, when we talk about polymer materials, that the, the three major applications are of course plastics. Then we have the composites and textiles, and and uh, so there are several common issues or, or common factors which are are are. are sort of for all of these three applications, which are really relevant, we talk about the sustainability. And of course, first of all, materials in general, when we, when we look at materials and environment, there are many factors to consider, like the source, the, the available material reserve, reserve, so it's renewable or fossil based, the, the composition of the material, how the material is, is, is manufactured and, and, and processed into to products. The properties and performance, life length and durability, and also uh, end of life treatment. So, and and um, if you have a, a car like this, uh, uh, it's clear that uh, the, the materials that you are using in a car compared to packaging is is completely different. You have completely different demands regarding uh, end use. Uh, well, uh, uh, the properties and performance, the, the life length, and so on. And uh, and uh, but really it's it's clear that the material selection will have an environmental impact and when we when it comes to the to the polymer that uh, which polymer we used in in a plastic uh, in a textile in a composite it will have an impact and and uh, the biopolymers are sort of available uh, uh, materials that have a, a good performance uh, relate if, if you look at the environmental impact then so uh, they are really good materials uh, to to select in our products so uh, if we then go into the these environmental challenges for plastics so so these are, are well well known and and uh, i think for all of you and and also be, being discussed a lot so of course uh, major part of the plastics are, are uh, made from non-renewable crude oil resources and uh, a lot of plastics are used in, in single-use products with very short life length. And that is causing then littering and pollution of the environment is very, very visible. And, and really, you can see that uh, in the news, in the, in the media, and, and so on. And we have this uh, concern about the microplastics in the oceans, which is really something that has uh, lifted up this question about the plastics uh, and, 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 and so on. And also, of course, related to textiles. And uh, we have seen a very huge increase in production and use volumes uh, during, uh, well, since, since plastics uh, were introduced around 1950 or something like that, uh, around uh, 70 years ago. Uh, so there has been a huge increase in production use volumes. And, uh, and these uh, environmental challenges are then really uh, reported in many occasions. And, and here is a very recent report from uh, VVF, uh, so, so World Wildlife uh, Foundation. So they, they um, have done a study here, which was released in, in actually on, on Tuesday this week. So where they really point out that what are the impacts of plastic pollution in the oceans uh, uh, on, on marine species, biodiversity and ecosystems. And, and if, if you read this, uh, you can sort of really see all of these, these challenges here. So, so when we are using plastics in, in, in different products and applications, we must sort of concern uh, this uh, issue, this fact here about uh, how the plastics are impacting the environment and uh, in different ways. But of course, we have a lot of environmental benefits uh, uh, for related to plastics. Uh, it is very clear that, uh, uh, and, and 
also this this must of course be will be considered i will not go into into those because it is uh, maybe very evident for for most of you what are the environmental benefits with plastics uh, but um, so there are both the, the challenges and then, then the, the, the benefits sort of when we look at the environment and, and the use of plastics. Um, <clears throat> and um, this situation has, of course, led to, to several actions. And, and uh, this is the most uh, recent one and also very important is EU directive from 2019 concerning single use plastics. And, and um, this directive is targeting the 10 most common single use plastic products found on European beaches and, and all of these 10 they uh, correspond to about 70% of all marine littering so here we can see cigarette buns food containers drink bottles bags uh, cutlery cups and lids balloons and so on so so there is a um, has been or uh, implemented uh, really restrictions and, and, and regulations concerning <clears throat> plastic use. And, and that is what in Sweden, for example, uh, you, you, we, we, there is a lot of more paper bags in, in the grocery shops now to, to, for, 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 for the vegetables and, and fruits and so on, uh, instead of having <clears throat> these very, very light, uh, uh, thin uh, uh, pl plastic bags. So, <coughs> oops. Okay, uh, and then it's it's when when we look at these questions concerning plastics and and I think it's it's quite interesting to to look at the textile industry, which is uh, uh, also addressing the same challenges and questions and. <coughs> Compared to, to the plastic production, textile industry is also quite a big volume uh, uh, material using industry. So about 100 million tons of fibers are used to, uh, uh, in the textile industry. And what is uh, also good to, to realize is that 60% <coughs> of that is, is polyester, actually. So, uh, and then they are also using a lot of cotton and then also viscose, which is a man-made uh, fiber and um, and uh, according to this we don't need to go into the details but according to this uh, graph here uh, the today actually it's only three percent of the of the um, textile materials so, so the fibers and yarns used in to produce textiles is is uh, recycled so 97 percent is actually virgin feedstock so this is a challenge for for the textile industry and they really are trying to to sort of uh, 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 come around this in different ways. And you can also, of course, see here the, the release of microfibers coming from the washing of, of uh, for example, polyester uh, textile uh, or polyester fabrics and so on. So then we go to the, these new economies and, and uh, this is the traditional way uh, of, of using materials. So we have the linear economy model where we uh, use material from cradle to grave and, and of course, these are using, uh, causing all of these uh, problems with waste, uh, a lot of waste and 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 uh, consumption of, of raw materials uh, and, and so on. And uh, the the new way is then uh, to look at uh, uh, this this uh, model here. This is actually the the so-called butterfly model, which has been presented by Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and I have a little bit adapted it uh, here. So. Here we have, first of all, the circle economy. That means, of course, recycling, reuse, recycling, and recovery. And into this, we can, of course, feed in crude oil or fossil-based materials, polymers, and so on. And they are then uh, manufactured. We, we are manufacturing uh, the materials, the products, and then have the users, and they should then go back here. But at the same time, in parallel, we have the bioeconomy here. So. By taking biomass, we can make polymers and we can make the products and we can use them and it can go back to the ecosystem by biodegradation and generation. So we have these two in, 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 in parallel here running. And of course, one thing is that if you talk about plastics is that the bioeconomy uh, is still very, very much smaller compared to, the, to this part here. And, and uh, by sort of having these two, uh, uh, ways running in parallel, we should, of course, uh, 
really avoid material loss here. So this should be very, very small. We should really avoid that. So all materials uh, should be recycled, uh, or then we should use bio-based materials, which can be returned into the to the to the ecosystem by biodegradation and so on. Um, and uh, I just want to show you this this picture here because uh, this is actually quite old and it was taken in the train between Göte Göteborg and Stockholm and 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 this is a quite typical situation when we talk about plastics then and and so on and, and also other type of of, uh, of materials um, because here are there, these are of course single use uh, materials here uh, and and uh, and. Um, uh, because of the situation here, we have this uh, coffee table in, in the train. So, uh, and he, it's clearly a lot of uh, waste is, is produced here. But the problem is, of course, that here you can really see a lot of different types of material. So, if you if you go through the picture, and I think there is uh, 13 or or well even 15 different materials here that are used. And and uh, of course, if you have so many materials, there should be some kind of, of uh, sorting of, of the of the waste and, and, and taking care of it. Or alternative is to use less different type of materials. So this is a quite good example of uh, how plastics uh, and, and, and also other materials are have been used. And as I said, this is uh, uh, maybe three or four years old picture. So maybe it looks a little bit different now in, in the train between Göteborg and Stockholm. Uh, so then about the biopolymers, what are the opportunities and challenges? And, and um, I, first of all, the alternatives I think have been mentioned before, but, uh, but uh, first of all, we have um, uh, two alternatives. So we can just take a biopolymer from biomass and, and then utilize that, such as the proteins uh, uh, presented by Michael Hedenquist. Or we can take lignin or we take carbohydrates. And here you can see the, the, the schematic picture of a cellulose microfibril and, and its composed of, of cellulose. And this is a really a remarkable material which is used in many technical applications. Uh, like paper and cardboard, but it's also used as, as uh, to make fibers, textile fibers, uh, viscose by diluting the, the, uh, the cellulose pulp in, in, in different uh, solvents. Uh, and uh, then you can regenerate the, the, the cellulose fiber and, and make uh, very good uh, fi textile fibers like viscose and, and lyocell and so on. Uh, the other alternative is as, as uh, discussed here about uh, uh, earlier here about, for example, lactic acid. So we can use biomolecules which are available in, in biomass to, to convert and then convert them into polymers. So, uh, for example, then lactic acid that you see here, but also fumaric acid, which is a component in, in thermoset uh, polymers, uh, or quite interesting, very interesting molecule here, the furan decarboxylic acid, which is um, uh, a possible uh, replacement of tereftalic acid, uh, and which then can be used in in in, in making um, uh, polyester fibers. So uh, we can either take the biopolymer that is available in the biomass, or we can take the biomolecules. And it's of course clear that it's there is a lot of uh, uh, how, how shall I put it, a lot of. Uh, work needed in, in, in order to convert uh, these uh, biopolymers into uh, something that is technically usable, uh, which has also been said in, in the previous presentations. Um, uh, the the pr production capacity of, of, uh, for biopolymers uh, today is, is shown here in this picture. And this is uh, a, a graph produced by Nova Institute. Uh, I really recommend to, to, to use the, the information that they are providing Nova Institute, and there are actually two two points. Uh, well, uh, the the um, the in 2025 there is sort of a, a perspective that it will be around six million tons of bio-based polymers uh, uh, produced, and and but this is quite interesting and important to to have a look at because actually these are many different polymers, really very very different polymers intended for different. Uh, type of application and so on. And that means also that if we would like to, to sort of uh, uh, reduce the number of, of materials, number of polymers, this is a little bit of challenges uh, and so on. Um, 
so for example, bio-based epoxy resins and, and cellulose acetate polymers or, or casein polymers or, or polyethylene terephthalate or, and so on. Very, very different polymers for different applications. And uh, then also it's very good to, to consider what is the, the relationship or, or if you compare to the crude oil fossil-based uh, uh, polyplastics, uh, well, it's clear that still the, the bio-based plastics are very, very, they have a very, very small share of the total uh, volume. And, and as you can also see here, this has been like a very, very uh, rapid, fast growth here, increase of, of, the, of the production volume. So this is, this is a clear challenge. How can we increase the, the amount of bio-based uh, plastics uh, or bio-based polymers and, and also how can we sort of make sure that we have uh, raw materials to produce this increasing number of uh, uh, or the increasing volumes of, of plastics for different applications. Um, so the, the challenges for, for biopolymers, this is, um, I would say, a little bit based on my, my experience and, and, and so on. And, and so you might have some other opinions and so on. But first of all, uh, the challenge is, is uh, well, we need to have a biomass source, which is uh, readily available in large volumes. We need to have technically feasible production technologies, and we need to have end use properties which are according to the market specifications. And, and of course, we need to have someone who would like to use these uh, biopolymers. So uh, established markets and end use are, are, are needed in order to have someone to buy, who will buy, buy these materials. And we need all, also to have an end of life treatment strategy. So that is uh, needed for all materials, all, all polymers, all plastics, regardless if they are biopolymers or bio-based or crude or based. And then final point, which is, which is very important, of course, the cost. What is the cost? How, how, how much will it cost to use a, a biopolymer in a cert, certain market sector? And this is like the current status. What, so how I think, well, we have very huge biomass volumes available. And of course, when we look at uh, where, of, I mean, the, the, the source for, for, uh, for the biopolymer, of course, we must consider that uh, uh, it should not compete with food production, for example, and, and also the production of, of this biomass should not be uh, really, uh, it has to be sustainable. And, and a good example is cotton. Cotton production is not sustainable if it's done in the traditional way, because it's uh, cotton cultivation uh, consumes a lot of water, fertilizers, uh, pesticides, and so on. Uh, so, um, so that's, but anyway, if, if you look at the, the biomass volumes, uh, we have a lot of biomass on earth available that we can use to convert into biopolymers. And if you look at the technical feasible production technology, so I think it's, it's clear that for several of these biopolymers, uh, PLA especially, and also viscose, it is available and we can produce viscose, PLA, and also some other biopolymers in, 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 uh, in high volumes and so on. And then for many, there is a still a need to develop a, a feasible production technology. And, uh, <clears throat> and the end use property should be according to the market specification. And, and well, it's for, for many of these uh, that you have, it's, it's on an acceptable level, but it can still be a challenge for, for many of these uh, uh, biopolymers under development. And concerning the markets, there are a lot of uh, well-established markets for biopolymers, and there are also many more possibilities. And of course, one the challenge here is, is really to find the, the right market for, for the right plastic. So that is what uh, said before here, that plastics must, uh, the right plastic must be used in the, in the right way, in the right market. And then, concerning end of life treatment strategy. So it is clear that biodegradation is a logical choice for, for those biopolymers which are biodegrading. Uh, so so uh, biodegradation is, is really something that uh, has to be implemented in, in a larger larger scale when we take care of, of end of life materials. And, and what Eric sort of pointed out is uh, uh, soil degradation of, of bio plastics was, is a very interesting uh, data and, and really it shows that uh, it's not 
we, we should not just throw out bioplastics in, in, in the environment and think that it will be sort of degrading in, a, in a very quickly. Um, we have to use industrial composting and, and really, really, really more, more better controlled uh, techniques for, for the biodegradation. And, and finally also, <clears throat> Uh, uh, concerning the cost, uh, uh, I think the, the cost is an acceptable level for the longest on the market. Um, I just also want to show, shortly mention the possibilities to make uh, biocomposites uh, from biopolymers, from bioplastics. So here is one example that we, we developed here in Buros in a PhD project. So here is a combination of PLA with hemp fibers and uh, the material here, these fabrics here can be compression molded. Uh, so converted to, to a composite like this that could be used, for example, in, in, in the automotive sector, uh, like uh, here in an insert here in a car, car door. So, so uh, this is a quite uh, interesting material. So we have a combination of PLA, so we, that is the, the matrix, and then we have the, the, the hemp fiber, which is the reinforcement, and by that way we get a, a high strength material which has, has very good properties and it can easily be processed into a, a product like this. And um, so uh, then I really want to, to finish here very quickly with something about Universal Bureaus, what we are doing in, in, in regarding polymers. So our offerings, uh, uh, we have, a, we have a, a very good polymer processing lab. We are can make uh, fibers, uh, filaments from, from polymers. We also have possibilities to, to, to extrude and, and, and compound uh, polymers. And, um, and we have also a, a newly started Master of Science, MS Master of Science program in resource recovery uh, titled Polymer Materials for the Circular Economy. And also we have the PhD school in resource recovery. And in the polymer field, we have so far completed 11 PhD theses since 2009. Um, and um, here are some of the research projects which are, are sort of uh, ongoing. I, I don't want to, to list uh, to go through this, but you can see here afterwards. So it's uh, re research concerning, for example, PHAs, uh, uh, lignocellulic biocomposites, uh, uh, using biopolymers in textile fiber applications, and, and uh, uh, developing biocomposites from fungal biomass. And also we are looking into how uh, some biomolecules which can be obtained from lignocellulose and, and then used in, 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 in for example, uh, composites or thermoset resins. And then to conclude here, so uh, I mentioned before the, the textile industry and, and, and uh, how it looks uh, there concerning material use. And, and the textile industry is really struggling with these questions about uh, uh, non-renewable uh, polymers and, 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 and so on, or fibers. And they have sort of uh, clearly uh, sort of set up these uh, uh, ways to, to sort of close the loop. So first of all, they want to move from fast fashion to slow fashion, they want to, move from fossil materials to more renewable and bio-based bio materials. So they want to really implement the bioeconomy. That means that they would like to, to sort of replace the, the polyester fibers with uh, bio-based uh, uh, fibers. Uh, and also this uh, second option here to move from virgin feedstocks to recycled feedstocks. That means to much better recycle end of life textiles. And also then, which is very important, is to move from a design where we have a sort of the, which is sort of adapted to the linear economy. So credit to grade, instead of the, the textile products should be designed so they can really be adapted and or fit the circular economy uh, way. So cradle to cradle. And um, for, for the plastic industry, I think it's, it's, it's uh, the same issues here, which are sort of uh, relevant and, and, and important. And, and of course, uh, we have to in increase the material recycling of end of life plastics and uh, biodegradable plastics, uh, biodegradable or biopolymers, which are biodegradable should be used in material applications, where, which are really best suited for disposing by, by biodegradation. And, 
clearly the bio-based feedstock for plastic should be increased. And also as here, we have to move from uh, really implement this uh, design, which is adapted to the circular economy instead of the linear economy. And the final point here is, is very important, which I think really must be done that we have to educate and inform consumers regarding sustainable use of plastic because this littering question, littering problem and, and, and so on, it is very much related to the fact that uh, plastics are not used in the, or handled in the right way at end of life. And uh, this is my <clears throat> the, the last, last uh, uh, picture here. So this is also from Nova Institute and, and they have sort of made this um, scenario for 2050. So how does the, the, the plastic production we look in, in, in 2050, so around um, uh, 30 years. And what is sort of uh, interesting here, what they say, of course, well, there should be no, there will be no fossil-based plastics in 2050. And instead, there must be much, much more recycling, and of course, much more bio-based, but also uh, a lot, a large uh, portion of this will be carbon dioxide-based uh, plastics. And um, well, this is a very challenging uh, target to, to move into this, but we will see how it, uh, how it will be. But it's clear that bio-based uh, <coughs> plastics will have a very important role in the future. So with that, I actually would like to just to thank you for your attention. And, and if you have some time, I can answer questions here or... or <coughs> so thank you very much. Okay. Mikael, thank you, thank you. A lot of information in short time. Yes, it <laughs> but was. You, so you sort of ended it up for me. I didn't need to take. I didn't. I don't need to say so much after this. But um, um, just one or two quick questions because I think people are eager to go to lunch now. Uh, there is one question: Have you conducted LCA for the biocomposite fabrics you presented? How is it with any additives and end-of-life treatment? I suppose they mean that one, yes, from the idea. Yeah, uh, well, we, we have not done any, any LCA analysis on that act, actual uh, example here, but it's of course now one, one thing is, is important. We talk about the composites uh, or composite applications. Composites have typically very much longer life length compared to the most plastics, so they are not single use. Uh, a car panel like that could have uh, like uh, 10 or 15 years of. of uh, of uh, life length and and that will of course have a, a quite important effect on the on the lca and especially when we look at uh, the properties so by using this uh, bio composite so natural fiber reinforced uh, biopolymers we will have a, we can reduce the weight of the car and then we will have a fuel uh, possibility to, to reduce the fuel consumption which has a very huge uh, uh, effect on on the lca so uh, that is sort of the answer. Yes, okay. Well, there are some more, but I think we have to stop here because it's over 12 o'clock and we, we should have been finished now. So uh, I, I thank you very much, my, Michael, for, for this presentation also. Okay. And you. I will say thank you to all four of you presentators uh, today because it's been excellent presentations and a lot of interest. We have had like um, uh, 350 people registered and uh, that's more or less a new record so there's obviously a great interest in this side of bioplastics also for the future uh, we will of course come back uh, we will um, we will um, uh, come back in the end of march with our annual uh, meeting uh, uh, it, it will be digital this year also we decided to do that even if we are going back to normal or to someone said abnormal maybe because we are used to another world now, but we will be able to meet, but we decided to have the, the annual meeting digital with some presentations. And after that, in April 26, we have a real meeting, a physical meeting in Copenhagen in Denmark, together with Danish plastics industry. Uh, it's a great conference for one day. Last time we, we arranged that, we had three, over 300 people attending. So April 26, if you like to go to Copenhagen, just in the middle at Rådhusplatsen, uh, you will have great opportunity to learn more about bioplastics and to visit the wonderful Copenhagen, of course. So for now, take a look at the vignette in the background. It's a better choice. We used to say that about bioplastics, but of course, bioplastics is not the solution for everything. Bioplastics should be used 
where it's suitable to use. And that's the way we're working. We, we will, we are, bioplastics will never be the only solution in plastics, absolutely not, unless we run out of crude oil, of course, but that's another question. So to all of you who's been listening, thank you very much. Uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks, this will be published again on, on the Nordic Bioplastics website, and uh, you will also get the presentations, uh, a possibility to download the presentations there from the site. We let you know. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>